Good afternoon and welcome to our Monticello live stream. Today we have Bill Barker as Thomas Jefferson and we're going to be talking about the American Philosophical Society, an intellectual institution that was very important to Jefferson. Please post any questions you have in the comments and let us know where you're watching from. Well, good afternoon, citizens, uh, and welcome here to our Monticello on a beautiful day out of doors. A bit chilly, but uh, it's delightful to see the flowers and all of the trees just lap this up uh, with a bit of cool before, as you know, we'll be beset with the warm hairs of summer. Uh, I welcome a conversation today with you as you choose upon any question you put forth uh, on our American Philosophical Society. And talk about questions, is that not what it is all about to begin with? Open and free inquiry, scientific investigation, something I've ever been interested in, and particularly something cultivated within me uh, through that privilege of an education. You know, when I was a young man attending the old Royal College of William and Mary, uh, there are a number of boys so inspired by Dr. William Small we have talked about him before. He held the chair of mathematics and natural philosophy at the old Royal College. So inspired to realize that within a few years, I would venture to say a good uh, 11 years uh, after I left the college, uh, and at the time when the old Royal College began to bestow, uh, well, a baccalaureate upon its students, I never received that, uh, there began uh, the Virginia Society for the Promotion of Useful Knowledge, 1773, uh, in Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, the president of the Old Royal College at the time was the Reverend James Madison. James Madison, uh, of course, uh, was cousin to James Madison, but he was a member. And uh, so very much at about this time, we were being inspired to pursue further open and free inquiries with the rest of our colonies and through the colonies, uh, which ultimately, of course, resulted uh, in many of us becoming members of the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia. And here I am rambling on and realizing that I'm denying an open and free inquiry. Uh, so let the floor be yours and let us commence. Uh, Ms. Holland, do you have questions for us to pursue? I do. So, Mr. Jefferson, can you just tell us about the American Philosophical Society, how it started and where? Well, I was not living at the time when the concept of it began to materialize in the mind of who else? Benjamin Franklin. As early, they tell me, about 17 and 27. Dr. Franklin, a young man having already arrived in Philadelphia from Boston, uh, becoming quite adept at printing, uh, decided to, well, pursue with some of his good friends a junto, a junto, otherwise, as the English would spell it, J-U-N-T-O, junto, a meaning a gathering and an assembly, a meaning, meeting uh, in Spanish, it evolves from the Spanish a government, you could say, of gentlemen of like mind in open and free inquiry. Uh, they called themselves the Junto and the Leather Apron Club. Leather aprons, of course, uh, being worn by printers in their capacity. But this was a group of gentlemen, I believe I, I recall Dr. Franklin saying, no more than 12, who were not altogether printers, but rather represented a diversity of various interests in their occupations. There were mathematicians, uh, there were astronomers, um, there were uh, bibliophiles. Uh, I remember one gentleman being talked about uh, who, who owned a, a great estate, welcomed the junto, the junto to meet at his house. But most of these gentlemen, Nicholas Skull was a map maker and mathematician uh, in their numbers. Uh, they would meet uh, each Friday in a tavern in Philadelphia. And they would report on various curiosities. Uh, they would read papers that they had prepared upon certain questions for which they were seeking more of a universal opinion and answers to this. So this is how uh, the American Philosophical Society began. Now, from what I understand, again from Dr. Franklin, it was not consistently 
year in, year out, since 1727. No, uh, perhaps certain um, efforts to attend more to business uh, denied them that opportunity to meet. But in the late 1730s, uh, there began another effort to, to form this more cohesively so that, uh, if you will, formally, as they say, uh, in 1743, the Junto, the Leather Apron Club, uh, all came together in what began as the American Philosophical Society. I can never forget that year because that is the year of my birth. <laughs> so that is how it began and grew well beyond but 12 members. Uh, in fact, I, I know that by the 1760s and 1770s on into the 80s, uh, there were upwards of about 500, uh, 550 uh, members, and from all over uh, the world, more predominantly, of course, Great Britain or France uh, in kind, and throughout our nation, our, all of our colonies, and ultimately throughout our new states. So that, and for the purpose, again, open and free inquiry, useful knowledge that can help to improve the condition of man. So along those lines, why do you consider the society to be so important to American culture? I think most importantly for American culture, so that we could show here in America, the rest of the world, that we were as adept to curiosity and scientific investigation and literally had in our own backyards uh, limitless resources uh, for the study of nature in all of its elements, and not only nature, but also the study of the arts of man, the mysteries of mankind. Uh, by that, in mechanics and medicine, uh, to study those and open questions. You know, a good friend of mine, uh, a member of the American Philosophical Society, I think has written a very good statement uh, about uh, why the American Philosophical Society uh, must be so uh, necessary for our nation, for America. The gentleman I'm referring to is uh, Monsieur Pierre Etienne Duponchot, or simply Peter Duponchot. Uh, this is what he writes. To convince the world that the true, full, and correct knowledge of America can only be obtained in and from America. So this is how we might, in the American Philosophical Society, be a beacon light for the rest of the world uh, as a tabula rasa, untouched in this wilderness, in this forest primeval, uh, for more extensive study. So you became the president of the society in 1797 after years of involvement there. Can you tell us about your various roles at the society, including what you did as president? Well, I thank you for that. I will tell you of all of my many appointments, all of my many uh, offices that I've held, uh, that one office, that presidency uh, of the American Philosophical Society is the one of which I am most proud uh, and most fond. Uh, I was uh, invited to become a president, uh, let me see, it was uh, uh, the 3rd of March, 1797. And the reason I remember that date is because there in Philadelphia, uh, we had already suffered uh, the presidential election of 1796. Mercy, who would forget it? Uh, former President Washington would not stand for a third term, and so there was somewhat a political vacuum. Uh, will we welcome his Vice President John Adams to be president? Well, there had already grown an opposition, of those known as the Anti-Federalists. I, of course, represented them. And um, remember, as our Constitution was written, whoever receives the second highest number of votes becomes Vice President, and um, that fell to me. So I lost that election, but look what I won. I saved the 3rd of March because the next day, March the 4th, was the day I was inaugurated as vice president. They in Constitutional Hall uh, in Philadelphia, attached to the old State House, or as it is becoming known, Independence Hall. That began what was 17 years of my most fond presidency. 17 years president of the American Philosophical Society. Now, when you consider that it's 1797, 
Well, what then can, uh, is, for, uh, is to happen? My presidency of our nation. And I would say perhaps one of my greatest uh, gifts to the American Philosophical Society uh, was the commissioning of the expedition, the scientific exploration, uh, the core of discovery, uh, led by Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant Clark. In fact, I, I can tell you that in drafting my commission uh, for uh, uh, Captain uh, Lewis, I followed pretty much a prescription that had been written by, by Benjamin Franklin as he created uh, the Junto back in 1727. Uh, the areas that must be studied, the, uh, the differences in climate, the composition of the soil, uh, make observations of the confluences of rivers, make surveys, if you will, of what you are encountering in an unknown land. Uh, so I believe the success of that expedition uh, over a little more than three years, the discovery of well over 150 variety of, uh, of flora, plant life never seen before, by the eye of man east of the Appalachians, let alone over 175 variety of fauna, animal life, never seen before, was probably the greatest gift that I could provide uh, our American Philosophical Society when I was president. Now, I'm not going to deny that during that time as well, I've remained very fascinated uh, with um, ancient life, uh, that is, fossils. Uh, that were being discovered not only in the west of Virginia, in Greenbrier County to begin with, uh, what initiated my curiosity of what I call a megalonyx, um, a great claw, if you will, of what could have been a, a ground sloth uh, many millennium ago. But also, if you will, the discoveries at Big Lick, uh, there in Ohio, near what is the small center of the Cincinnati, uh, right now and continues to reveal abundant fossils uh, which, which I may tell you we have been able to put together in more or less recreating a great woolly mammoth. Uh, in fact, I will tell you while I was president, 1707, president as well, and I'm speaking of the two presidencies, or seven, I was both president of the American Philosophical Society and had entered my second four years as president of our nation, uh, being sent so many of these fossils, particularly uh, by General Clark, William Clark, who as you know accompanied Captain Lewis, uh, from Big Lick, uh, all of these fossils were brought to the president's house and I called upon my friend, uh, who was a president of the American Philosophical Society as well, Dr. Casper Wister of Philadelphia, to come down and join me at the president's house that the two of us might there uh, on the floor of the Great East Room set out all of these fossils, uh, all of these different fossilized bones of what we felt would uh, come together in the Great Woolly Mammoth and try to put it together ourselves. Uh, so that was one of the, uh, uh, well, the discoveries, let alone the efforts and experimentation that uh, as a member and president of the Philosophical Society and as a fellow member uh, and later president, Dr. Wister, uh, we endeavored at that time. Now I could go on and talk about uh, my studies of the Hessian fly. I can talk about some of my early studies and experiments about the difference in temperatures and climates, particularly an early experiment in the difference of temperature between Williamsburg, Virginia and Charlottesville, Virginia, which I conducted along with the aforementioned Reverend James Madison. Uh, and uh, well, <laughs> how far do we go when we run out of time to discuss all of these wonderful curiosities? Well, we have a few questions here from our viewers. Um, Mike asks, what would be a good example of how the APS put thoughts and ideas into practice? I think when you think about uh, the general diffusion of knowledge, and, and that is a term that I have used. Uh, in fact, it was bill number 79 uh, in the 126 revisals of the old monarchical code in which I was born and grew up. Uh, that is what can begin to create uh, systems of schools and schoolhouses throughout our nation that the American Philosophical Society is essential in helping us to understand that the core of education 
is open and free questioning, curiosity. How are we going to know unless we ask? And so this is where an American Philosophical Society supplies us with these initial investigations and discoveries, but also as a result of questioning and further observations allows us to set in cement, if you will, facts. Facts. Remember what John Adams said, defending the British troops in Boston, uh, facts are stubborn things. And so I think that the American Philosophical Society and all of its various uh, subjects that they pursue can help establish a foundation of facts for the education of our youth and for future generations to take advantage of. David would like to know that would like to know when the society would meet, were the topics predetermined or was it an open forum? Both, David. Uh, you would initiate or put into uh, the counselors, the committee of counselors, and I was a counselor uh, many times over, uh, the subject and suggestion that you would like to pursue in reading your paper upon the subject so that they would know we have uh, papers uh, to be read at our next sessions when we gather. And then as a result of reading the papers that had been accepted uh, to be read as we would meet again, there would be the questions, the open and free inquiry that all of us together uh, could discuss. So actually both of what you are suggesting uh, was an effort and uh, the, um, the agendas, if you will, of our meetings as we gathered in Philadelphia. So we've had a couple of questions. I'm going to combine these into one. Basically, some of our viewers would like to know what you have presented to this group or any findings you've reported on, papers you've presented. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, well, I was talking about the megalonics, the great ground sloth. I've read a paper upon the great ground sloth. And, and later, uh, I remember, we discovered that someone else uh, had themselves, this, I'm trying to remember the name and I cannot bring it up at this moment, had discovered a bones very similar to that. And so that made me realize I need to go back to the paper I initially read upon the discovery of the megalonics. And remember, that began uh, in Western Virginia in Greenbrier County uh, with the discovery of that fossil, uh, that I would go back to that paper and amend it uh, and then be able to present that again with these further discoveries and findings. Uh, I mentioned uh, the Hessian fly. Uh, this was a pesky little fly that was brought over in the, in what would you call it, the bedrolls, the knapsacks of the Hessian mercenaries. Remember, hired by, by England to engage the war with us during the American Revolution. Uh, they came over in great numbers. They camped along the shores of Lake Champlain and they introduced this little fly that immediately laid devastation to all of our corn crops. Now, this was not localized uh, unto New Hampshire. Uh, the devastation of the Hessian fly proceeded down Lake Champlain, Lake George, down along the Hudson River, through New York, all the way down in our, our nation in the East Coast to Virginia and the Carolinas. So an effort to understand this uh, was pursued by James Madison, uh, my good friend up here at Montpelier, uh, when we both met in Williamsburg there, uh, let alone uh, that his cousin, the Reverend James Madison, was also as curious as well. But it was James Madison and I, uh, the fourth president, that made a trip into New England, and we called it the trip to the Northern Lakes, to study uh, the destruction of the Hessian fly and come to a conclusion for a paper that, uh, that I might read there at the American Philosophical Society. So that is another subject that was read before. I read a, a paper on my creation of the mold board plow of least resistance. Now, I would like to say that this was my unique creation. It was not entirely. There were these mold board plows that I actually saw when I was sailing up the Rhine used in the Germanies. And they say that many uh, of the Ger uh, German farmers uh, have come up with this over a time. What is the mold board plow of least resistance? Very simply. The British had long used a, a plow uh, that had the blade at almost a 90 degree angle cutting through the soil and then the mold board was the wooden board behind that blade that was perpendicular to it, stood up straight. 
So you can imagine how inconvenient this was to allow you for a more efficient slicing through the dirt. The moldboard plow of least resistance began with the blade, which was at an angle. So you're cutting through the soil at an angle. The soil then rolls up over the angle of that blade, and the moldboard behind it is not perpendicular. It is bent a little ways towards the back, and it's rounded. So you see how the soil, almost with the natural propensity of how the soil is composed, rolls over the blade, then rolls over the mold board behind it, and is much more efficient. So I did uh, give a paper upon that subject as well. We have a couple of questions about membership in the society. So how were new members chosen, and were there any requirements to be allowed entry? Members were chosen by more or less recommendation and association with other individuals of particular curiosity and scientific uh, uh, interests. I, I mentioned earlier mechanics. I have mentioned uh, as well astronomy. Uh, I have mentioned um, uh, chemicals, uh, alchemy, if you will, uh, surveying and mathematics. Uh, all of this was, um, was w composed, if you will, the, the vast array of subjects which as members of the American Philosophical Society we would be interested to, to open into discussion and hear papers to be read upon them. So if you knew individuals who were so interested, well then quite naturally becoming the better acquainted with them and their interest in the American Philosophical Society, uh, then they would be invited and voted upon to become uh, a member. Uh, now, you may ask, why was I <laughs> invited to become a member? Well, I would say perhaps two things. Firstly, uh, I had already been uh, acquainted with Dr. Benjamin Franklin, uh, the founder of the Junto, and then the first president of the American Philosophical Society. Uh, I had also uh, been well acquainted with uh, Mr. David Rittenhouse, uh, as you know, the self-taught mathematician and astronomer uh, who built a very fine orrery uh, that I was actually going to present to the King of France had uh, I been able to sail uh, to be in Paris at the time the Treaty of Paris uh, was being uh, negotiated. Uh, I, I, the Treaty of Paris was signed before I was able to sail, and I never had that opportunity to present Mr. Rittenhouse's aura. But I had already become friends with him and well acquainted with him. And then, I was governor of Virginia. <laughs> I was the second elected governor of Virginia in that year, 17 and 80, when I was invited to, to become a member of the uh, American uh, Philosophical Society. So I think by acquaintance, by association, and by mere curiosity amongst gentlemen of, of learning and, uh, and gentlemen devoted to open and free inquiry. You know, here's one of the most fascinating things when you enjoy meeting individuals who are so curious. You realize
Okay, sorry about that. We had some technical um, difficulties. I think we should be back on now. So maybe we can continue with another question. Oh, <laughs> are we all back together again? Yes, uh, the joys of technology. Um, technology, there you are, <laughs> the art of scientific investigation. There you have it, technology. I wonder whether that word was coined amongst the members of the American Philosophical Society. And by the way, wondering what happened. Is that not in itself uh, an in instance instigating conversation and curiosity? I don't know whether you heard me before uh, 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 we had a, a technical difficulty. But I was emphasizing uh, the Latin phrase, sapia alde, be so bold to question everything. And here's a further thought upon that matter. When you realize that our creator has created our minds free and free he intends it to remain, well, be so bold even to question his existence. Why? Because he would not want it any other way. This signifies the beginning of the enlightenment of the mind of man. And I like to say our nation, perhaps the very first nation in the history of man, founded upon the principles of enlightenment. Okay, well, let's go to another audience question. So um, we've had a couple of people ask about membership in regards to female members. So oh. this got, the society began with men, but do you know, were women ever allowed to become members? Yes, of course, and one in particular uh, who was quite prominent, uh, it's this Daskova the Princess Daskova of, of Russia. And uh, her family were quite instrumental in seating Catherine the Great upon the throne uh, in Russia. Uh, but Princess Daskova was very devoted to scientific uh, curiosity and open and free inquiry. Uh, she was devoted, if you will, to the elements of astronomy, to the elements even of medicine, all subjects. Uh, were to occupy her in pleasant conversation. So yes, I can certainly set forth uh, the Princess uh, uh, Daskova. I'm also thinking of Mrs. Wister, Casper Wister's wife. You know, after Dr. Wister died, I believe it was about uh, 18 uh, and, and 18, and uh, he, of course, seceded me as the president of the American Philosophical Society. Uh, but after he died, his wife was very instrumental in keeping alive his friendships and making certain that all of his friends would stay together. Do you know that even as somewhat of a, uh, an addendum to the American Philosophical Society were gatherings known as the Wester Parties, where individuals who from foreign lands were stepping foot for the first time on American soil in Philadelphia if they were of note, if they were of accomplishment in their own nations, in their own land, they would be invited to Dr. and Mrs. Wister's house uh, for a Saturday gathering uh, to enjoy beer and, uh, and chicken salad and, and oysters. And there we would have conversations at the Wister parties that would often lead to many of these uh, individuals, foreign dignitaries in kind, to be invited to become members of the American Philosophical Society. So who would ever deny that the ladies and the wives of many of the members uh, were always of influence, let alone. Interesting uh, uh, people who've been part of the society. Well, as I've been thinking of those from foreign lands, uh, of course, Alexander von Humboldt, a good friend of mine, uh, was a member of the American Philosophical Society, particularly his travels uh, throughout South America and his various discoveries and his publications of books were most worthy for him uh, to be invited. My good friend, who was a great hero of our American Revolution, particularly in the defense uh, of West Point, uh, General Thaddeus Kosciusko. <laughs> General Kosciusko was also a member of the American Philosophical Society, and who would ever deny a General the Marquis de Lafayette? Yes, uh, invited very early on to become a member of the American Philosophical Society. Uh, General von Steuben uh, was a member of the American Philosophical Society. You heard me uh, remark upon my good friend, uh, Peter Duponchot. Uh, he had been more or less an attache uh, for General von Steuben. He had accompanied uh, General von Steuben uh, uh, coming over to our young nation to help fight in support of the American Revolution. 
and uh, Monsieur Dupanchot uh, then became a, a secretary in the Department of State, where I presided, as you know, a secretary of state when our government was in Philadelphia. Uh, Monsieur Dupanchot then read the law, became a well-esteemed and accomplished uh, lawyer in the city of Philadelphia. He as well, a member of the American Philosophical Society and quite prominent uh, in his interest and pursuit of the various languages of the natives of our land, the American Indian. And this was a subject that the two of us would want to correspond upon many times, let alone his suggestion in studying Chinese. He was quite the accomplished linguist. In studying Chinese, he began to realize that in the characters of the Chinese languages, uh, many were to presume that they were ideography, that these characters represented ideas that were coming forth. No, it was Monsieur Dupanchot who said, no, it's lexography. In other words, these are precisely letters that uh, uh, are being symbolized here, let alone words that are being symbolized. So I think that was a great advance to recognize and suggest that uh, Chinese is lexography and not ideography. Uh, oh, Monsieur Dupanchot, I read his statement earlier, uh, was so devoted uh, to our conversations establishing America uh, as very much premier uh, in the world of scientific investigation. Well, do you think the American Philosophical Society played any significant role in forming our nation and constitution? I would like to think so, absolutely. I would like to think that in the duties of the Congress, uh, Article 1, that, um, that we find, if you go down Article 1, Section 8, and then read down eight paragraphs. Article 1, Section 8, eighth paragraphs, 188, you will discover that uh, one of the new duties of Congress is uh, to promote the progress of science and the arts. It's right there. I would like to think that uh, our Constitution, uh, our government has been the first in the history of the world to note that as a founding principle and one of the duties of our government to promote the progress of science and the arts. Well, last question here for you. What do you see as the future for the society and for intellectual pursuits in our country? Illimitable. That's the future, it's illimitable, as is the human mind. New frontiers of discovery always before us there. Uh, new investigations uh, of science yet to come. The real So, at the forefront, how can we ever deny, in my opinion, will ever remain our American Philosophical Society? And as we all want to adjourn with this last question, I've decided something most useful myself to read. Uh, this is a, a comment that I made in a letter to Mr. John Hollins. And I think I, this will help us better understand that not only is science and curiosity innate, not only is useful knowledge most necessary for improving the condition of man, but to realize how it is wont to bring the family of man across this globe together in a semblance of peace and congeniality. This is what I wrote. These scientific societies are always in peace around the world however their nations may be otherwise at war. Like the Republic of Letters, they form a great fraternity or sorority, spreading over the whole earth, and their correspondence is never interrupted by any civilized nation. A civilized people welcome this correspondence. They welcome these conversations. They welcome moving forward, never falling back into the darkest ages. Thank you. I look forward for our next convening. And do visit the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia.